Pinoy. Games that people put millions of dollars in doing this same mistake. And it's clearly a mistake. Because let me rephrase how this works. I start your app. The only thing you know about this user is that they want to play your game. And you're giving them the choice, A, ignore it and go play the game, or B, don't play the game. So say it's my favorite game in the world. I love this game. It is the best game ever. I start the game up. Hey, do you want to not play it right now? No, I want to play this game right now. It's the best game ever. Now let's say I accidentally tap your game. I'm starting my phone or, you know, I'm kind of bored. I'm messing around and I click it. Hey, do you want to rate it? Well, yeah, I didn't really want to play anyway. I guess I'll go rate it. Three stars, yeah. two stars. You're just asking for bad ratings. It's not about that quantity. It's not about just getting people in the store because you're just going to get that bias of negative ratings. You only want to ask people who are really going to be into your game, who are really going to like it, who really want that five-star review. So an example of that, if, if somebody's playing Zombie Pumpkin Slayer and they go through 50 levels of pumpkin slaying mm -hmm. and they, I can tell through the metrics that I'm collecting with my game that they really love the, the game, I'm going to ask them to rate it then. Yeah, is absolutely. Great. Even better is that as they're getting through, it's not just in between levels, like, wait, you want to keep playing or rate. You do it in a nice pause moment. So for my game, Blast Monkeys, we were a free game. So we had in-app currency to be able to unlock the next level. If you got enough points, you were able to unlock it, or you gave us money, then you could do it. Another option was you could rate us in the store to get a small amount of coin. So somebody plays Blast Monkeys, eh, they don't have fun, wasn't their game, whatever, they quit, they're fine, they leave. Someone who really likes the game, someone who wants the new content right away, and better yet, they didn't want to wait for it or keep playing, they saw the button to go rate us in the store, and suddenly we got 300,000 five-star ratings. Because all the people who loved our game, we then asked at that strategic moment to go rate us. So figure out where that strategic moment is in your game and only ask there to go rate. And this also goes with social. You can't just say in between levels, oh, hey, post this to Twitter, and the tweet message is, I'm playing this game. That's just saying, hey, could you please go advertise for free for me? Hey, could you please spam your friends for me? It's just asking for a handout, and people don't like doing that. A much better message is, I'm playing Pumpkin Slayer, Zombie Pumpkin Slayer, and uh, I get a really awesome high score. I see on my charts that I beat you, Jason. So I send you a tweet and say, hey, I just beat Jason in the high score charts. So I got this many points. Now you're getting a notification that says, hey, Tobiah just beat oh, you. Oh, man. I'm going to have to go back in and beat you. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's a much better engagement. Yeah. You're interested in that message. I'm interested in sending it. It has value. It isn't an advertisement. It isn't value because I got... 500 in-game coins for tweeting. It's intrinsic value that I wanted to tell Jason that I beat his high score, and thus I'm better than him, because that's how that works, right? Yep. And then in you know, my competitive nature, I'm going to have to go back in and beat Tobias' score, because mm -hmm. that is the nature of things. Next, speaking of you know, that, that negative messages, you want to have an outlet in your game for people to be able to rant at you. You want to have some email box that they can tap, pull up a message, and tell you something, anything. And I can tell you from experience, most of the messages you're going to get there is, this game sucks, or this is buggy, or I hate this. But that's great. And the reason why is that some number of those people who play your game and they don't like it for whatever reason, they're going to go to the App Store and they're going to rate it one star. But if you give them that outlet to say, hey, this sucks, they get it out of their system, they're fine, they send that message to you, and then they quit and they don't go and rate it. Even better, you can be tricky about it. You can have it automatically include in that email message what device they're using, what version of the app they're using, maybe some last error messages, you want to be really fancy. Then you can look at that list and go, oh, I see where there's a problem. So say you get you know, a bunch of emails like, hey, this device isn't working. Well, wait, why is that? You can go get that device. Oh, wait, so there's some screen aspect ratio problem, fixed above, push out an update. Even better, if you give an optional return email address field, you can contact them and say, hey, thank you so much for pointing out this problem. I think we fixed it. If you want, you can go try it out. But thank you so much for your help. Now, I guarantee you, if you reply to a message, no matter how hateful it is, 
99% of the time, they're going to turn around completely. They're going to say, oh, thank you. I love this. It's awesome. You're cool. They're going to tell all their friends, oh, man, I knew this developer for this game. We talked. We're buddies because yeah, I helped them out. A little bit of customer service goes a long way. A huge way. Yeah. Having that communication with your audience is a big deal, and you want to make it as direct as possible. And so, again, speaking of communication, let's get to the last point in app store optimization. Be remarkable, literally. I mean, you want to literally have your game something that people want to talk about. You make it as easy as possible for people. You know, first step for that, make a press kit, make a website. You might be looking at this as like, oh, okay, I'll put a link to the app store. And yeah, your app store presence is needed, but you need something for people to talk about. Say I'm a reviewer for a magazine or some website and I want to write about your game. If I don't have anywhere to link to, I'm less likely to want to write about you because it just seems weird to talk about this amorphous game project. Or even worse, say I want to write about you and I want to use a screenshot. I'm not going to open up your app, take a screenshot and manually upload it to my computer. That's work. If you make it easy for me, if you give me a list of press-worthy screenshots, you give me a write-up, a description about the game and how it works, you give me the website to link to, make it as easy as possible for people to talk about you. Even if your game isn't popular yet, this isn't something you need once you get popular. This is something you need in order to get popular, in order to have people write about it. No, let's, let's say I do this. I go through the trouble of sending my game for a playtest to a, a journalist, and they give me a, a horrible review. Should I just give up? Should I quit? No, absolutely no. not. Games you have to iterate on. You have to continually build that up. You have to build a community around that game. Bad feedback? is positive, is good. Look at Minecraft as an example. That game started in pre-pre-alpha, completely buggy. You look at all the early access games that are going on right now, those games are popular not because they're perfect, not because they're amazing, but they're building up a community around it. Let it be okay that there's problems in your game and have that communication. Tell your audience, hey, this is what I'm working on. What should I work on next? This is part of having a website, having a Twitter feed. It isn't just for you to spam out one-way message and not get anything back. Start that two-way dialogue. Even if it's like 10, 100 people, those are not going to be your hardcore fans and grow over time. This is an exponential growth. You can't just start off with hundreds of thousands of fans. You have to start with tens of fans in order to build up slowly and build that story and have that message. And playtesting in public is such a great thing right now. Everyone's doing it. You can Twitch stream your game development live. You can talk with people and consumers love it. They want to know how the sausage is made. They want to know how games are being made and they want to hear it. So tell them your story. It's interesting. You're a small independent developer. You have a, a great story right off the bat, no matter what you're doing or what stage of development you are. You have to be a lightning rod for success. A friend of mine told me that once. It's a really great message because it isn't just about I'll, lightning's going to strike me and then I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be really lucky and go up to the top. You have to make yourself ready for that success, ready for those press releases, ready for both success and failure. Too many devs out there don't pre prepare for failure because let's be honest, most apps fail. And so they prepare, well, okay, I'm not going to do this full time. I'm not going to you know, rely on this as my main source of income. But they also don't prepare for success either. They don't set up a website. They don't do a press kit. They don't do any marketing. They just kind of let it sit there because they're thinking, oh, well, it's never going to be popular. Well, if you think that, well, it will never be popular. You have to actually do the work as if it is popular, as if you're ready for it to be big at any moment ahead of time and then ride that wave once you start getting it. One article could be that spark that starts the fire, that starts you going. But if you don't have any Tinder sent out, you know, it's just going to be one article, one and done. Okay, so then Zombie Pumpkin Slayer is the best game ever made ever in the history of video games, and I'm just going to approach it that way. Well, you have, can't just think like a developer. You can develop the best game in history and if you don't do anything with it, no one's going to find it. If you're an indie, you have to think like a publisher. You have to actually market your game. You have to actually ship your game. You have to actually iterate in public on what's going on. You have to do what a publisher would traditionally do. We're talking about indies as not having publishers, but that doesn't mean you can skip out the publisher role. So you can't just develop the best thing ever. 
Because if I have the best game and no one sees it, no one knows about it, what's that going to mean? And that also brings up post-release content. I've talked to so many reviewers that will look at a game, and if it hasn't been updated in the last three months, they won't write about it, no matter how awesome it is. And they have told me, literally, well, if they, aren't, they don't care about their game, why should I? If you're not updating your game constantly, it shows that you don't care about it. Just as an example, go look at your favorite apps on the App Store. Go ahead right now, you can do it. You're going to see that they were updated probably in the last six months, more likely in the last three months, even if they've been out for years. Just continue little updates, continue little pushes, just showing that, hey, we still care about this game. We still care about this community. We're still adding new content. You have to think of your apps in this post-release cycle, constantly adding new things. And that brings me to my last big point. Apps are a service. So many people think of apps as a product. And you have to think of apps as a service industry. That means it's something that you continually do. It's something you continually update. A product is something you make and ship. Maybe you make 1.1 and you ship that. This is what you're used to. If you've been working at a you know, regular job, most of the time you're in a product industry. The AAA games industry is a product industry. Apps are a service industry. You have to think about continually updating it. This applies to freemium games, but also to premium games too. You have to constantly add new content. Blast Muggy is my game, my company. We are updating it every two weeks. We had something new in the game. And that was key to our success, to constantly build up that community, build up more games. And it certainly wasn't the first game we made. A great example is Angry Birds. Everyone knows Angry Birds was the 52nd game made by Rovio. That's 51 games of relative obscurity, of barely getting by money, of thinking they're going to have to close down the studio in layoffs. 51 games. 52nd is the most popular game of all time ever. You can't give up early. You can't just release a game, see that it doesn't go anywhere in three months, and go, well, no one automatically downloaded it and didn't magically become popular, so it must not have been that good. Every game takes iteration. You know how many downloads, you know how high in the rank Angry Birds got in the first three months? Top, top 100? No, pretty no. terrible actually. I think they got about 10,000 downloads, which isn't horrible actually. This is a pretty good amount of downloads. Yeah. If you think about how it was a studio working this game for a year though, they were hemorrhaging money really badly. A lot of people I talked to, they, if I showed them the numbers of what Angry Birds was at three months in, they would have said, well, clearly this game's a flop, cut it loose and try something else. But they didn't do that. They invested more advertising dollars in it. They kept pushing it. They put new content out there. And then it started getting popular. Blast Monkeys, about three months in, not very popular at all. I, mean, I would even admit we've had like a thousand active users that went about three months in. Four or five months in, we were the number one Android app. Big differences can happen overnight. And it's not because three months in we started doing something differently. It's that exponential growth. Those tens of fans started turning into hundreds of fans, started turning into thousands of fans, and eventually turned into millions of fans. A great example is Antichamber. If you can look at the GDC vault, there's a really good talk uh, on Antichamber. It was, I think he called it uh, Overnight Success, Seven Years in the Making. He's so working on the game for seven years before he finally got it out there, and then he made, like I think, $5 million in the first week or something crazy like that. Okay. Everything is a skill. This is the last point I want to leave you with. Everything you do is a skill. You know development's a skill. You know when you start coding, you're going to have to iterate on it. You're going to have to jump into it. You're doing a lesson like this to start doing something. You know, if I talk to an artist and I say, oh, hey, you're an artist, you learned art, so did you do art by analyzing what's in art galleries, what are the top artists, who's you know, hot, you know, being talked about, you made an art design document where you wrote up what your art piece is going to be like, you bought this amazing canvas and these super expensive paints in a studio, and you planned out exactly what you're going to draw, and then you finally took the paint and went to the canvas and made a masterpiece and were super successful? Sounds really silly, right? Sounds kind of stupid. No artist is going to think that's the way you do it. Why do app developers think that's how it works? 
Why do app developers think they can look at the store, figure out what the number one apps are, to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write an awesome design document. They're going to jump into their engine for the first time, making their first game, spend a year working on it, release it, and expect that it's going